Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. God's grace and peace be with you all. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary, joining us from home via our live stream. We are happy that you are here in worship with us this morning. Uh, this is a special morning for us. Uh, remember, following service this morning, we'll have our first fellowship. I'm calling it our first post-pandemic potluck, uh, to put the alliteration on front of everything. Uh, but uh, we also want to honor uh, Mary and Paul Thompson this morning. This is not their last Sunday with us, but uh, coming up uh, near their last Sunday, they're, they'll be moving to, uh, uh, moving to Georgia shortly. 
want to remind everybody, uh, if you have not gone to the parlor and partaken in the present that we are presenting to Paul and Mary, again with the P alliteration, uh, please make sure you do that if you want to take a few moments during worship uh, at the beginning or following worship. Uh, uh, I will uh, assemble everything and we'll present that to Paul and Mary in our fellowship hall. Uh, please remember to go to our website, fccbrla.org. At the top, uh, you can find a link to this morning's live stream. That's also where you can sign in uh, your name, your family name, and if you have any special prayer requests, insert those as well. Um, also, uh, just in case anybody needs to step outside uh, for, for any particular reason, we do have a TV on in the church library. Uh, if you need to excuse yourself for a few moments, uh, the live stream is active in there as well. Those initial announcements given, I am proud to hand our prelude over to my daughter, Lane, and a little piece that I think you will recognize. Lane, take it away for us. That's my daughter right there. That's my daughter right there. Uh, speaking of musicians, we are glad to have uh, Johnny Dupree back with us again this morning. Johnny, thank you for leading our singing this morning. Um, Aaron is away doing, uh, taking care of some family business. Um, Wednesday, uh, Bible study, 1 p.m., meets in the library. That goes out via Zoom as well. Information for the Zoom call goes in your emails. Choir rehearsals have resumed, and again, everybody is welcome to join with that. 6 p.m. is Women's Chorus, Chancel Choir at 7, all of those in the sanctuary. And uh, question for the day, uh, something for you to hold in mind this morning. Uh, how do you see others, and how do you see yourself? What do you look for when you look at others, and what do you see when you look at yourself? Those are some questions we'll ponder this morning. Have a little more to say about that in my sermon. Bill, would you please lead us in the call to worship? Please stand if you are able. Please join me in our call to worship. Come, all who are weary, tired and broken, for the Lord will renew our strength and give us wings like eagles. Come, you who are tired of keeping up with the Joneses, for the Lord knows us and will provide all that we need. Come, all who feel too small, too young, too old, or too weak, for the Lord looks upon in hearts and makes a new creation in Christ. Let us worship the Lord together. Please join me in our hymn of praise. Come, Christians, join together.
Please join me in prayer. Mighty God, to you belong the mysteries of the universe. You transform shepherds into kings, the smallest seeds into magnificent trees, and hardened hearts into loving ones. Bless us with your life-giving spirit. Recreate us in your image and shape us to your purposes through Jesus Christ. Let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. All right, um, an adapted reading from Psalm 20. I pray that the word will listen when you are in trouble and that the God of Jacob will keep you safe. May the Lord send help from his temple and come to your rescue from Mount Zion. May he remember your gifts and be pleased with what you bring. May God do what you want most and let all go well for you. And then you will win victories and we will celebrate while raising our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all of your prayers. I am certain, Lord, that you will help your chosen king. You will, my ans you will answer my prayers from your holy place in heaven, and you will save me with your mighty arm. Some people trust the power of chariots or horses, but we trust you, Lord God. Others will stumble and fall, but we will be strong and stand firm. Give the king victory, Lord, and answer our prayers. sinus infection. You don't know how it's going to be when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> but we are here, all of us, aren't we? I'm so glad to share with you today because one of the things I like to share with you from time to time are stories. But today, the subject matter is what is exactly meant by creating us a new heart, oh God? That's a deep subject. Deep subject, boys and girls. For the messages that we get as boys and girls, as men and women, are things that we take with us in stories each and every day. When Jesus was teaching his people, he told them stories. They told parables, and they were little lessons and how people should live their lives. It was about having a clean heart, about accepting God and accepting him as their Lord and Savior, about having a clean heart and preaching the word of love. So creating a new heart is not just being good on the outside, but it starts from the inside. So boys and girls, each and every day, no matter how you feel on the outside, it starts from the inside. Thank you.
We prepare our hearts for a time of prayer together. We have a number of folks uh, asking for prayers. Uh, first of all, our administrative assistant, Joe Craddock, in the office asked for prayers for her friend Sylvia, who is beginning chemotherapy. Uh, just before service, uh, Mike Wilson uh, has uh, asked prayers for his wife, Tony. Uh, they have found some kind of a mass in her chest. They don't know what that is yet, so she's been... Uh, taking a lot of tests here. They're still to diagnose what that is, but uh, ask you keep Tony Wilson in your prayers. Beverly and Tip ask for prayers for their friend Maxine Rack. Uh, Kathy Porchot asks for friend, uh, prayers for her friend Larry Latef, uh, medical uh, uh, circumstances. And also Nathan and Paul ask continued prayers for Nick Tulier. Um, He's, uh, he's been struggling lately, and we continue to keep him in our prayers. Uh, celebration this morning uh, in the Krupala household over here, 25 years anniversary. So, can, well, he's not, I, I know you still love your husband, even if he didn't show up here, so we're not worried about that. Not worried about that. Um, also, as I mentioned this morning, uh, Paul and Mary, uh, not our last Sunday with us, but we want to honor them this morning, thank them for their decades of service and commitment uh, to this community and to Christ, and surround them with our prayers and wishes for many happy years in their new home in Georgia. Let us join our hearts together now in prayer. Lord, we come to you confessing that so often... Our eyes are one of the only filters through which we see this world. We look for perfection, beauty, attractiveness. What catches our eye is so often something that is only skin deep. But you are the God who looks at the human heart. You see our feelings, our intuition our passions, our deepest desires. So, Lord, this morning, as we are before you, we ask that you would search us from the inside out. Try us and transform us. Let us see ourselves according to what is going on on the inside, by character. May we be motivated by a desire for righteousness, May our deepest hunger be for a sustenance that comes from you. May we also see others in a different light as well. Not according to our whims and feelings, but as you see them. People made in your image, your handiwork, worthy of redemption. We are all broken. We have all sinned and fallen short. By your grace, we are redeemed. Lord, we ask that you would continue to teach us to walk by faith, not by sight. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. One body broken, words now are spoken for you, for you. One who has suffered, one life he offered for you, for you. Forgive them, he said broken he bled, given and shed for you. We once divided, now are 
are united in Christ, in Christ. God's ancient promise poured out upon us in Christ, in Christ. Baptized we're whole, we're strangers no more. All is restored in My favorite stories is of Guy de Maupassant. He was a French writer who lived in Paris, and like so many Parisians, he hated the Eiffel Tower. He couldn't stand it. Most of the city of uh, Paris has an architecture that comes from 1700s, the 1800s, and that big steel edifice just did not fit with the city at all. He disliked it so much that every day for lunch, he went to the restaurant right under the Eiffel Tower. His reason being that was the only place in the city where he could sit and see the Paris skyline without the Eiffel Tower looming over it. He learned to view it from the inside out rather than the outside in. As many hymns and phrases we sing about coming to the cross and standing at the foot of the cross and laying down our burdens at the cross. And I double-checked this, but in all the New Testament, it never says anything about disciples standing and looking at the cross. The only invitation in the New Testament is that disciples would take up their own cross. We're not to look upon it. We are to see the world from the point of the cross outward. Viewed from the outside, the sign of the cross, it's a sign of humiliation and suffering. Paul says it's foolishness, a stumbling block. But viewed from the inside, from the point of view of those who take up their crosses, it is the unfolding story of redemption. This morning we come to the table as those who look at things from the inside out. The cross of Christ, this bread, and this cup, in remembrance of Jesus. It's more than just a little wafer and a sip of juice. It's spiritual food and drink. It's sustenance not for a moment, but food for eternity. Let's join together now in prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we rejoice in this opportunity to worship on this day in your house among those who look to you both in times of celebration and in times of need. We know that you are always there for us, and for this we cannot adequately voice our appreciation. Lord, each time we gather and worship, we come together at this table. You are a constant, steadfast, and unchanging but we are not. Every day our lives are different, so every day our cares, our concerns, and our expressions of praise and thankfulness are different. You see us in a unique light each Sunday, and you offer us the opportunity to draw closer to you, no matter how our circumstances have changed, day to day, week to week. This is a truly marvelous gift, and we are forever grateful. As we partake of this bread, which represents the broken body of your son, and this cup, which represents his spilled blood, we do so in remembrance of the sacrifice he made on our behalf, giving his life for our sins so that we might enjoy eternal life in your kingdom. 
For this we are so thankful as we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, following the meal, Jesus took a cup, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and drink. This cup is the cup of the new covenant which is in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let's take a few moments of quiet meditation as we prepare to hear the scriptures read to us.
a reading from 2 Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether you are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who, might, who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, see? Everything has become new. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We continue our series from the book of Samuel. I'll be reading from chapters 15 and 16. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. and The Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and Say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And You shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord, word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. We continue in this four-week uh, sermon series from the book of Samuel. Last week we were in chapter 3, and this week we're in chapter 15, and a lot of drama has transpired. So I want to jump right into some of those details because it helps us understand what, what, uh, what's going on this morning. You remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about Hannah, Samuel's mother, and how Hannah was struggling with infertility, and she prayed to God, and God answered her prayer with a boy, Samuel. And last Sunday, we heard about how Samuel was appointed a prophet while he was still a young, young boy serving in the temple of God. Remember as well, religion at that point, faith in Yahweh, the God of Israel, had fallen on hard times. There was Eli, the chief priest. He was getting old. His eyesight was getting dim. Eli had two sons who were in line to take over the priesthood, but those sons, they were no good. They took sacrifices that did not belong to them. Their morals were terrible. The people were rejecting the faith in Yahweh because of everything that was going wrong. Add to that inside pressure, that outside pressure that began to emerge, Philistines. You remember those good folks. The Philistines began making raids on the Israelites and their towns. The Israelites decide, well, we have to answer this, so they muster some troops together and they go out and fight against the Philistines. And guess what? They're defeated. Israelites ask, well, what should we do now? So they decide, well, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that God that we used to worship? Let's let's see if that God can help us out. So they bring the Ark out, and they go against the Philistines one more time, and guess what happens? The Israelites are wiped out again, And the Ark of the Covenant is taken captive by the Philistines. Pagans now have control of the very symbol of God's presence. The priest Eli, his sons are killed in that battle, and at hearing the Ark of the Covenant has been captured, Eli falls over backwards dead. It almost seems like faith in Yahweh could come to an end right here. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? We need, we need to have some education with our younger ones because there's so much you can learn from Raiders of the Lost Ark. For those of you who don't know, in the final dramatic scene, the Ark of the Covenant is opened by a bunch of Nazis. And you remember what happens in that scene? They take the cover off and the Nazis think, oh, we're going to have untapped power to conquer the entire world. And what happens? God unleashes fury and kills everyone there who sees this glory coming forth from the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that that guy and his face melted and he was all bloody and newsy and gross and it was great stuff. It was great stuff. <laughs> Steven Spielberg did not come up with that idea by himself. Uh, the thing is, Steven Spielberg kind of stole this idea from the scriptures. The Philistines now have the Ark of the Covenant captured, and what happens? God begins to unleash fury on the Philistines. Tumors begin to break out on people's bodies. Rats invade the city wherever the Ark is. Their god, Dathan, keeps falling over, and its hands break off, and its head breaks off the idol, and 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 this thing becomes like a civic hot potato. The Philistines are passing this. I don't want this anymore. Here, you take it. You take it. Finally, in the end, the Philistines decide we don't want this anymore. They put it on an ox cart, send it on its way, give it back to Israel, want nothing more to do with it. Samuel is there. He welcomes the ark back sets up a new place for worship. The people rededicate themselves to the Lord, and it's all a happy ending, right? The drama keeps going on. Human events keep unfolding. 
Eli had trouble with his two sons. Samuel has two sons. Samuel has problems with his sons as well. Samuel sets his sons up to be judges for Israel, but unfortunately, they are corrupt as well. They take bribes. The people reject them. And now we're worried, what is going to happen with leadership in Israel? How will Israel move forward when they have no one to lead them? This is where the Israelites, they get together, they begin to talk, have some counsels. What are we going to do about leadership? And then they come up with a great idea. Rather than these tribal judges we've been using, we need something bigger. We need something like what other peoples around us have. We need someone impressive and famous. We want Samuel to appoint for us a king. We're just a couple weeks from July the 4th. Fellow American citizens, what do we think of kings? Thumbs down, right? Kings are a bad idea. No, kings are awesome. They could, they, could, they could really rally people together. They were trendy. They were new. They were as popular as roller skates at that point. Kings were cool. We need a king. At hearing this, Samuel... And Yahweh, the God of Israel, they kind of become like old party balloons that have been inflated for about a week, and, you know, just the air leaks out of them. No, we don't want this. The thing is, there's a slippery slope between kingship and deification. What is deification? Deification is a human being claiming or being viewed as a god. It's a slippery slope. In primitive societies, it's a short move from popular personality to being worshipped as divine. In that vein, I'd like to take a moment to introduce to you the latest in the pantheon of demigods who are walking among us. Jeff, could you bring up that next one? Here, Here he is, Charles, Prince of Wales, the divine. Now, I read about this this past week. Fascinating story here. Uh, His father, uh, uh, Prince Philip, passed away. And when Prince Philip passed away, Prince Philip was being worshipped by some people who lived on this island called Tana in Vanuatu, which is out in the South Pacific. And after uh, Prince Philip passed away, they then deified Prince Charles. You can change our our slide back now. Uh, The group that worships Prince Charles now as a god are a part of what anthropologists call a cargo cult. I just discovered this fascinating story here. There's a bunch of little islands out there where these peoples worship deities. There's Charles, Prince Philip. There's even a couple of kind of anonymous Americans. One of them is named John Frum, the god John Frum, and then another guy, Tom Navy. And you can imagine where Navy came from. World War II, there was a lot of Americans in the South Pacific. This cult began to develop during colonial times with the Portuguese and the Dutch, and really took off in World War II. What happened is these native peoples, they worked hard every day. They slaved away in their fields, and yet at the end of the day, they were still poor and impoverished. Meantime, all of these colonial powers came in, and the Americans came in, and they didn't work nearly as hard as the natives did. But they did this curious thing. Instead of planting groves of palm and things like that, they just wrote things on paper, sent it away, and wouldn't you know, here comes a ship or here comes an airplane loaded with food. Well, in their minds, looking at the daily practices of the Americans and the Portuguese and the Dutch, they decided what this actually was, was 
some kind of religious thing that was calling in this cargo, this wealth, these riches from the gods. So they began building their own airplanes out of sticks and hay, and, and they cut a landing strip, and they stood out there and they waved their arms like, like, like they saw the landing guys do, waiting for the gods to send this cargo in. One time, Prince Philip came in, probably on a ship, to visit part of the British Empire. They saw his wealth, decided he must be a god. He is one who can provide this cargo, this wealth for us, and they began to worship him as a god as well. In primitive societies, it's a short move from popular personality to divinity. But before we feel too uppity, about what primitive societies do, let us take stock of our own society. In advanced societies such as ours, it is a short move from popular personality to divinity. Are you with me, church? You know what I'm talking about here? How much of our culture's skies are filled with stars and starlets whose only talent or contribution is that People think they look pretty. Athletes, actors, musicians, politicians, charismatic figure, uh, figures, the, the list goes on. We start listening to every word they say. We start believing that somehow they will bring us the blessed life that we are looking for. Humans don't have that power. Only God has that power. Well, Saul, back to our story in Samuel, Saul is appointed king over Israel, and he looked like a king. He stood head and shoulders. He would have been head and shoulders for sure over my short stature. He looked like king material, but Saul's ego kept getting in the way. He was impatient, anxious, didn't handle disappointment well. He was surly and hard-headed, and God rejected him. But both God and Samuel grieved this great disappointment. But the story has to move on. God sends Samuel to an unlikely place, Bethlehem. Now, all of us here, I think we all smile when we hear that city name. We know the Christmas story, but this is, this is long before the Christmas story. At that point, Bethlehem, it was a dusty rural outpost for sheep herders. God sent Samuel to the family of Jesse, a man with many fine-looking sons, and God directed Samuel to anoint of all of them the youngest one, the least likely, David, to be the future king. Just a boy, just like Samuel had been chosen when he was a boy. We ask, well, why is that? Why did God choose such a young man to be the future king? The answer is clear, because God is looking at the heart. Not physical prowess, not training, not credentials, not wealth. Our God is a God who sees hidden potential. This morning, Paul reminds us as well, we walk by faith and not by sight. And that's not some pie-in-the-sky religious notion. It's a very practical thing. Paul has a contentious relationship with the Corinthian church. The Corinthians keep looking at Paul through human eyes. Paul wasn't physically impressive. His sight was failing. His, his rhetorical skills were not as polished as others. He didn't have letters of recommendation from the highest authorities. But what Paul had, as far as Paul is concerned, this is what really matters, what Paul has is the gospel, the message of the cross. And even that has some serious flaws from a certain view. Viewed from the out, outside, the the cross, it was a stumbling block and foolishness to most of the world, but from the inside, the cross is the message of redemption and salvation. If we were to read on, we would find that David 
He was far from perfect. He had that affair with Bathsheba. He tried to cover it up with murder. He was sinful just like everybody else. But what he knew is that when he got out of his lane, called to account, he humbled himself. He knew what it meant to be a man after God's heart. It is so easy to be distracted by exterior appearances. A classic story for me. I was studying for a PhD at Catholic University. This was my first time to live outside of Kansas, Texas, and kind of the Midwest. Over there on the East Coast, different flora and fauna there. Remember, I was in the library, and I looked out the third-story window, and outside on the lawn of the campus was this big, beautiful tree that was dropping these large nut clusters. I wondered, what in the world are these things? I saw a woman out there collecting them, so I thought, well, let me, let me go see what they are. And I went out, and I kind of broke it open, and inside was the most beautiful chestnut that I had ever seen. Now, I wasn't very familiar with these because in Kansas and Texas, these things really didn't come into the grocery stores. But on the East Coast, you know, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I, you know, I heard that line. In the grocery stores, I started seeing bags of these things showing up. They're like 15 bucks a pound. I couldn't afford them. Here on the college campus, this tree was dropping them left and right all over the place. And the thing was, they were even prettier than the ones that were in the grocery store. They were polished, this gorgeous kind of chestnut brown color, if you will. Just beautiful. I, I picked up a whole bag of them. I took them home. I proudly crowed to my wife, look, I have found all of these free chestnuts. I went to Google and I looked up how to roast chestnuts, found the instructions, cut the little hatch mark in the top of it and put them in the oven, roasted them up, put some salt on them, pulled them out still steaming hot, and I bit into it and realized there is a fundamental difference between the chestnuts in the grocery store and the buckeye that I had just bitten into. Apologies to any Ohio State fans here, but Buckeyes are bitter, nasty, and they're toxic as well. I spit it out, and it's a good thing I didn't eat any more of it. It's a beautiful looking nut on the outside. It looks like, man, that thing must be delicious, but what's on the inside? You don't want to go near it. This morning, we set, that self, we set that insight before ourselves. I think there's two ways to look at this. Number one, what do you look at when you look at others? What are you looking for? Is it just exterior appearances? How well coiffed their hair is? How beautiful or outwardly talented they might be? Big smile? Or do you look at what's going on inside, the character of the individual? What's, what is it inside of them in their heart? The second insight for us is this. What do you see when you look in the mirror in the morning? Do you feel like you're not beautiful or handsome enough? Best years are behind could be thinner or smarter or wealthier, or maybe you look in the mirror and see a beautiful exterior. Never ask yourself, what is it that is in my heart? God looks at your heart. Next time you look in the mirror, don't look for the wrinkles and blemishes where you'd like to see a little work done. Look for lines of love. Examine closely for wrinkles of joy. Bask in a glow of peace. In your reflection, see the form of patience. 
Let the vanity lights illumine your kindness, slather on goodness, massage in some extra faith, smile at the appearance of gentleness, wash your heart with self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. That's what God wants to see within us. Work on those. Let your beauty shine from the inside out. Amen? As we prepare to close this time of worship, I invite us to sing together a hymn. It's titled, Give Me a Clean Heart. Uh, This is probably a new one for us, so we're going to go through it three times. First time, we'll listen to Johnny uh, introduce it to us, and then we'll join together and sing it together two more times. Give me a clean heart. Thank you again for your help these past two weeks, Johnny. Really appreciate it. Uh, Please remember, if you have not been to the parlor, uh, to stop by there. We have a little uh, gift to present to Paul and Mary uh, in our uh, dinner together. Uh, As you go head towards the fellowship hall, uh, rather than a long serving line, we've put all the plates already out on the tables. Uh, So if you just want to go to a table, find a plate, and your silverware is there. And then we have three serving tables spread around the fellowship hall. So as you see the opportunity, uh, make your way to one of the tables. Uh, Drinks are at uh, this uh, east side of the fellowship hall, my left, as you're looking at the fellowship hall. Uh, Let us stand, and we'll sing our closing refrain. Uh, Close with a prayer for our meal and the benediction. Peace be upon you and guard you forever. Go in the knowledge that God is with you. Father, for this meal that we are about to share, we thank you for your providence. We thank you for uh, what we receive as we sit down to table together. We thank you for Paul and Mary for their dedication to you and to this community. We pray blessings upon them. 
Now, brothers and sisters, as you leave, remember the world you see is not necessarily the world that God has intended. May your eyes be open to the workings of the heart. May your ears be open to hear the deeper meaning in between the words. May your heart be open to the anointing of the Lord. May the wisdom of God, the peace of Christ, and the inspiration of the Spirit be with you as you go forth to do everything that is pleasing in God's sight. Amen.